All right, well, welcome everyone to the 56th annual lectureship of the David Geffen School of Medicine. I'm John Maziotta, I'm the Vice Chancellor of Health Sciences. And we're honored to have you here today to um, hear our lectureship award recipient, Jennifer Doudna. Dr. Doudna is a Howard Hughes medical investigator. She's professor of chemistry and molecular and cellular biology at UC Berkeley, and she also holds the Li Ka Shing Chancellor's Chair in Biomedical Sciences. Dr. Doudna, welcome to UCLA. We're uh, excited to hear about your amazing work that's changing not only biology, but probably society. The annual lectureship is a long-standing tradition of the School of Medicine that reinforces the importance of scientific exchange and breakthrough discoveries in biomedical science. The essence of a great university is discovery, new ideas, new knowledge, all of which benefits society. Innovators like Dr. Doudna embody all these goals and are the quintessential, quintessential expression of human curiosity. So your program says that Interim Dean Kelsey Martin is going to introduce Dr. Doudna, but we changed that, and I like to uh, Ask Doug Black, professor of microbiology, immunology, and molecular genetics, an expert on RNA biology, to introduce our speaker. Thank you, Dean Maziota. Well, I feel like I'm introducing, I don't know, Bill Gates or something. There's a <laughs> it's really my pleasure, great pleasure, I think, to introduce my, my long-term colleague, Jennifer Doudna, for the uh, Geffen School lectureship. Uh, Jennifer really, it, I think she can only be described as one of the most admired and influential scientists in RNA biology. And I think I'm going to skip the long list of academy elections and breakthrough prizes and so on and try to say something about her science and, and really um, some of the science that, that led up to what she's doing now, which, which um, all of you are, are most familiar with. So uh, Jennifer actually is from Hawaii. She grew up in Hawaii and uh, came uh, to stateside to go to college. She went to Pomona College, close to here, and then went on to do her PhD at Harvard Medical School in Jack Shostak's lab. And at Harvard, she really pioneered the entry of the Shostak lab into ribozymology and the, the study of the early RNA world. And I think that's where she got her start in RNA biology and interest in, that stuck with her. Um, and she went on then to do her postdoc with Tom Check at Colorado, studying the structure and enzymology of, of RNA again. And um, she took this work with her when she started her own lab at Yale in 1994, where soon thereafter she, she um, uh, determined and published the structure of the P4, P6 domain of uh, group one intron. And this um, result, uh, it seems long ago now, but it's hard to really overstate its impact on the RNA field. It was the largest RNA structure that had been solved to date, quite a bit larger than the long-studied tRNAs. Um, and within this structure, um, it, it illuminated a number of structural features and um, principles of RNA folding that are really now commonly held principles in the study of RNA function and, and, and folding. So Jennifer moved to Berkeley in 2002, where uh, her positions were just described by the dean. And at Berkeley, she um, has been uh, continuing her studies of, of um, ribozymes and RNA biology and biochemistry, but she's also branched out into um, many other areas of RNA biology. She's, she's worked on areas of translational control, viral iris function, uh, enzymology of the RNA interference pathway, um, just to name uh, some of the more uh, larger projects. And, and through this, she's, she's trained many uh, some scientists who are now leaders in all of those fields. And so if I were to try to, to describe, you know, Jennifer's kind of special style or traits of science, I, I would say that, that through all of this work, she's displayed a, really just a remarkable skill for seeing what the key information that's needed to, to drive a field forward, to, to what experimental pr approach, often grounded in structural analysis, uh, will really break, you know, change uh, the question that, that's being asked. I think it's a, a rare talent that, that the, only, the other person I think of with, with this talent is um, Phil Sharp. <laughs> 
Uh, and so a number of years ago, uh, Jennifer became interested in the mechanisms of host defense systems in uh, bacteria, and in particular, uh, the, uh, the enzymes and, and gene products that were encoded in what were called CRISPR loci uh, that uh, mediated bacterial resistance to infection. Uh, and so what's ensued from those studies, I think, is really one of the great demonstrations of how basic research into um, interesting but m maybe not particularly mainstream uh, biological questions can r have an absolutely pervasive impact on, on much larger fields of science and medicine, as all of us are, are now aware of some of the things that have come out of, those, of, of these projects. And so to give you just a small amount of, of the history of these projects, um, without too much about the biology of, of CRISPRs and, how, and their diversity. Um, the Dowden Lab first started studying what are called the type 1 CRISPR systems, publishing a beautiful structure of the multi-subunit cascade complex that mediates uh, DNA recognition and cleavage of, of the invading DNA. Um, and then uh, subsequent to that, or, or uh, as time went on, they turned their attention to what are called type 2 uh, CRISPR systems, where in place of the cascade genes, there was a special gene called Cas9. And uh, in studying this, um, this, these type 2 systems, uh, the Doudna lab, in collaboration with um, Martin uh, Yinnick and, and um, Emmanuel Charpentier in Berlin, um, developed biochemical assays for this, this Cas9 polypeptide and showed that uh, this was uh, a single polypeptide uh, nuclease that could be programmed to cleave a wide variety of sequences uh, through its interaction with a CRISPR RNA and another RNA cofactor. And so that uh, paper, I, I always like to re recommend this paper to students that was published in August of 2012. It's really a landmark result of, of nucleic acid biochemistry, and it's really changed everything that, that we do uh, as molecular biologists. And it uh, was followed in January 2013 by results from three labs, the, the Doudna lab, Fang Zhang's lab, and, and George Church's lab, showing that uh, one could, in fact, express the Cas9 pr uh, protein in cells, uh, along with the proper RNA, and uh, achieve highly specific targeted cleavage of a mammalian genome at sites of one's own choosing. And so the, the efficiency and ease with which this, this worked uh, Im immediately caught people's attention as a tool for, for the, the developing field of genome editing, and it opened really the floodgates of, of work on this, on this enzyme by, by many labs, uh, and I think in 2013, so that, that, that paper from those three labs, those three papers were published in January 2013. In the rest of 2013, there were more than 100 papers published um, showing targeted cleavage in really all variety of organisms and uh, developing the CRISPR-Cas9 into really a wide variety of, of um, uh, incredible tools. Uh, I was actually lucky uh, t enough to be on sabbatical in Berkeley um, at the end of that year, which was really a, just a remarkable experience to see just the pace of progress, the number of labs that there were every day there were results coming out. Um, and that rate of development um, uh, has really only increased since then. And, and I, think, I think we can say that CRISPR-Cas9 is, is a standard tool for all of us in, in modern biology. And so uh, Jennifer's lab went on. I mean, they've they've been major contributors to the tool development, but I, I think it's all they've also maintained their focus on basic mechanisms. And in the last year or so, they've published lovely papers on the type three CRISPR uh, systems, on how on how cell bacterial cells acquire the targeting sequences, and other uh, quite uh, uh, fascinating aspects of of CRISPR biology. And so finally, then I I, I think. I, I need to comment that, that uh, powerful new technologies you know, raise questions for society and, and their appropriate use. And uh, uh, Jennifer has been at the forefront of calling for public discussion of how these tools should be used, how, what, what, what's an appropriate um, use of this technology, how genome editing uh, might be by used usefully and, and how perhaps it shouldn't be used. And so these kinds of discussions, these public discussions, were uh, uh, reached a, a, a milestone last week at a remarkable meeting at the National Academy, where many of the stakeholders and interested parties uh, met uh, a meeting that, that Jennifer was really instrumental in um, organizing. <laughs>
So you can see then that there's much for Jennifer to tell us about. And before I bring her up here to talk about uh, her talk, uh, the deans are, are going to come up, Dean Maziota and, um, and Martin. Is that now? Yeah. You weren't moving, I was worried. <laughs> and Jennifer. So we're really delighted to present you with this 56th annual uh, lecture. Uh, SHIP Award from the School of Medicine. Here you go. The fake check. Introduction. I really appreciate that, and it's been a great day here. Um, I, and I think you know it's always a great pleasure to see a lot of students uh, here because I think that um, this work, as I'll tell you about today, and you heard a little bit about in the introduction, is a great example of how your own curiosity about nature and how biology works can lead you in unexpected directions. And I have to say, over the course of my career so far, that's really been my experience. Is just by following what I thought was interesting, and of course what my students uh, thought were, was interesting, We've, it sort of led us in um, directions that I never could have anticipated, including the story that I'll tell you about today. So, uh, so what I thought I would do today is really tell you about the origins of the CRISPR biology research in our own lab and how it led us to thinking about this as a technology for genome engineering. And then I want to tell you a bit about uh, how this actually works, because we're really a lab that focuses on molecules and mechanisms. We like to understand uh, how these kinds of activities occur in cells. And then I'll tell you a bit about where I think this is going in terms of its application uh, in the clinic. And then at the end, I want to say, come back to this point that Doug made at the end about the ethics of genome editing and where this is going in the future. So I want to really start by just, just pointing out that, you know, if, you, if just a, even a few years ago, if you had thought about uh, the, the ability to change the DNA sequence in a cell in a very precise fashion, it was still somewhat in the realm of science fiction. And in fact, I can remember being a graduate student in Boston in the 1980s when Peter Durvin and other, uh, others were actually already thinking about you know, how you could actually do this in the context of the genome of, of an entire cell. And the challenge really was, could you envision a way to make a very precise change to the DNA sequence, so precise that you might be able to change a single base pair? Imagine that, just a few atoms in the entire genome of, say, a human cell and be able to fix a mutation that would otherwise cause disease, it's sort of an amazing uh, thing to think about, sort of very analogous to, uh, you know, being able to make a very precise change to a, a document in a word processing program. And, and, and for us, the, you know, the path to this kind of technology actually came about through, a, uh, through our effort to understand how bacteria fight the flu. And I noticed that my uh, resolution is cutting off the bottom of these slides. Should I try to change that or not? I don't know. Um, it might be risky, so I'll, 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 I'll read you the bottom of the slides. But basically, it was a curiosity about how bacteria fight uh, viral infection. And so I want to tell you, I, I'm going to sort of do three things today. I want to talk about how uh, we got from studying a sort of, as Doug said, kind of a somewhat obscure area of biology um, it, to, a, uh, to a, 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 a biotechnology. And then I want to tell you a bit about how this technology actually works from the standpoint of the molecules involved. And then at the end, I'm going to come back to this question of how we think about using this technology both in the clinic and also uh, from a bioethical and societal uh, perspective. So for us, you know, the, the CRISPR systems really came first to my attention about 10 years ago when a colleague of mine whose picture is unfortunately uh, not showing at the bottom of the slide, uh, but Jill, Jillian Banfield, who's a very well-known uh, scientist at UC Berkeley, uh, called me up one day, and you know, her lab does metagenomic sequencing of bacterial genomes. And she contacted me because she said, you know, we're, we're seeing a very unusual sequence signature in the genomes of many of the bacteria that we're investigating. And mostly these are bacteria that have never been cultured, never even been identified. 
And in her research, they were coming across not only these uh, bacterial genomic sequences, but also the, the viruses that infect uh, these organisms. And what was very, very interesting was that a number of these bugs had a, a, a repetitive DNA sequence in the genome that consisted of a, a, of a, a sequence of DNA, typically 40 base pairs or so in length, that was repeated over and over in the genome. And, and what was very interesting was that in between these DNA repeats were sequences that were derived from viruses. And again, these sequences were 30 to 40 base pairs in length. And what's not showing here is three papers that were published in 2005 from three different bioinformatics groups that all pointed out that this uh, sort of sequence signature had the sort of had the characteristics of some kind of a system in bacteria. These were conserved, and the fact that bits of viral sequence were being integrated into the bacterial genome, uh, you know, sort of made people start to wonder if this was some kind of acquired immune system in bacteria. And, and what was also interesting was that adjacent in the genome were typically CRISPR-associated or Cas genes that seem to be co-evolving with these, these DNA sequences. So it looked like some kind of a system, and these had come to be called uh, clusters of regularly interspaced short palindromic repeats, or CRISPRs. So if you see that in the media, it's actually referring to these sequences uh, right here, these sort of signatures of what emerged and came to be uh, known and, and understood as a bacterial acquired immune system. So why did Jill call me? Well, she called me because, as Doug mentioned, you know, we've had a long-standing interest in my lab in understanding how RNA molecules are used in cells to control the expression of information in the genome. And one hypothesis at the time was that maybe these sequences were actually operating uh, at the level of RNA. In other words, the cell might be making an RNA copy of these sequences and then using those RNA molecules to help find matching viral sequences, much the way eukaryotic cells use a process called RNA interference. So we began uh, sort of playing around with these systems, and um, what emerged over the next several years, and in a sort of another interesting twist uh, about the biology here, it was really uh, initially genetic experiments done at a yogurt company, the Nisco. Uh, that showed that, um, that these systems actually do operate as an adaptive immune system. So they allow cells to detect viral DNA that is, uh, gets into the cell. I'm showing it here as a phage uh, injecting its DNA. Bits of that DNA can be integrated into the CRISPR locus, and that integration occurs such that each newly integrated bit of sequence is flanked by a copy of the DNA repeat. And we, in work that I won't tell you about today, we've actually in the lab uh, done a number of experiments to understand exactly how that uh, integration process works. And then uh, these sequences are transcribed into RNA, and those RNAs are then processed into shorter bits that each include one uh, bit of sequence from a virus. They assemble with proteins encoded by the Cas genes to form RNA protein targeting complexes that then use the information in the RNA to base pair with matching DNA sequences and allow these proteins to cut up the viral DNA. So it's a very, very nice way that bacteria create a, what's effectively a genetic vaccination card in the genome that creates a permanent record of viruses they've been exposed to over time and then uses that genetic information to protect the cell. So we started uh, really focused initially on this central part of the pathway, namely how these RNAs are made and how they uh, form RNA protein targeting complexes that can interact with DNA. And so, uh, and as Doug uh, mentioned, we started off working on uh, what are now called the type 1 CRISPR systems that involve multiple proteins that are part of these targeting complexes. And then I, in 2011, I went to a meeting of the American Society of Microbiology, and I met uh, Emmanuel Charpentier, who is a medical microbiologist working on uh, Streptococcus pyogenes, an important human pathogen, which has a different kind of CRISPR system in the genome, namely a system that had only one gene called Cas9 that had been shown at that time genetically to be important for the, this acquired immunity in that bug. And so we uh, decided to team up to figure out the function of that, uh, the protein encoded by the Cas9 gene. And so that project led to uh, research that was done in both of our laboratories by Martin Jinek in my lab and by uh, Christoph Chylinski in Emanuel's lab. 
And what these two guys figured out was that Cas9 is a protein, uh, shown here in this blue, that binds uh, to, to uh, double-stranded DNA, opens it up sort of locally, and is able to make a blunt double-stranded DNA break at a site determined by a 20-nucleotide sequence in an RNA molecule that is derived from the CRISPR locus, so one of those transcripts from the CRISPR uh, sequence in the genome. And so here's the, the targeting sequence right here. And importantly, this is a system that requires a second RNA to be functional. So in bacteria, this is an RNA called tracer that is important not only for generating the mature CRISPR transcripts, these molecules, but it actually stays associated with the end of the CRISPR RNA where it forms a structure that can bind to the Cas9 protein. So you really have to have both of those RNAs to assemble a functional uh, targeting complex. And we also figured out that these, uh, these targeting sites have to occur next door to a little motif in the DNA that for this protein is a GG uh, dinucleotide motif. And when that's all uh, there, you have the RNAs and this little motif and complementarity to the guide RNA, then you get this uh, reaction. And so it was through that biochemical uh, uh, dissection of how this actually worked that led Martin Jinnick in the lab to figure out that he could trim away some of the extraneous, or at least functionally extraneous, uh, sequences from these two RNA molecules. And he figured out that he could actually create a simpler system than what nature has done by turning this into a single guide uh, RNA, by connecting the ends of these molecules to form uh, a complex that looks like this, where we have in a single transcript, both the targeting information and the Cas9 uh, binding information. And so in, in a, a very sort of simple experiment that Martin did to test whether these single guide, uh, this uh, single guide type of construct could actually work for DNA targeting by Cas9, we did an experiment, and very sadly, the cool result is cut off the bottom, but, but I'll tell you what it is. Um, and that is that, so we had a, a DNA, circular DNA molecule, a plasmid, and Martin designed five different versions of the single guide RNA that were adjacent to these GG dinucleotides, and then just incubated this purified DNA with the Cas9 protein programmed with one of these different uh, single guide RNAs uh, together with a different res another restriction enzyme that cuts about 60 base pairs upstream. And when you look at this, uh, the result here, what you could see was that each little piece of DNA that was released, and this is a, actually an agarose uh, gel system, each little piece of DNA released was exactly the size that would, was predicted based on where Cas9 should be cutting the DNA guided by these different uh, constructs. So we really, this was for us really the moment when we knew we had a two component system that was quite simple to use where you could easily manipulate the site of DNA cleavage by just changing the sequence of RNA in this, in this uh, single guide uh, type of construct. And just to show you a little bit in a little more detail how this actually works, so this is a, a 3D printed model of the Cas9 protein that's based on a crystal structure that Martin Genex lab solved and published last year. Um, he's now at the University of Zurich. And what this shows you is the protein in white um, it's got a, a sort of a cleft running down the center where this guiding RNA in orange is located. And the way this works is that the RNA actually makes a, uh, a helical interaction with one side, one strand of the double helical DNA molecule as it traverses through the proteins. You can see the RNA-DNA uh, hybrid right here. The other strand of DNA is opened up. And then the protein has two molecular blades, two active sites that come in and actually cut uh, the DNA. So it's a very precise kind of, almost like a molecular scalpel to cut DNA. And so you might be thinking, well, that's fine, but how does that get us to uh, genome engineering technology? And this is where I have to, to um, bring in all of the great work that had been going on really for the past several decades in which many labs around the world had come to appreciate that in animal and plant cells, there's a very robust uh, mechanism for detecting double-stranded DNA breaks that occur in the genome. So if this is the genomic DNA and there's a double-stranded break that occurs, that break can be repaired by a couple of, uh, by different pathways. The primary ones are non-homologous end joining in which the DNA is ligated back together, typically with a little insertion or deletion at the site of repair, or if there's a donor uh, DNA molecule present in the cell, then this can actually be recombined into the DNA to repair this break with the insertion of new uh, genetic information at that site. 
And so it had been appreciated that if you could control where double-stranded breaks were induced in a genome, you could actually trigger these pathways and thereby trigger very precise changes to be made uh, to the DNA of a cell. And so you're, um, probably many of you here are familiar with uh, some of these protein-based uh, technologies that had evolved to do this, zinc finger nucleases and talons among the most famous of these, as well as uh, homing endonucleases. And these are, are proteins that can be designed or programmed to have very specific DNA binding activity. And then by coupling them to a DNA cutting domain, you can actually have a site-specific DNA cleaver. And these can work extremely well for inducing precise changes in a genome of cells. So lots of excitement about these technologies, but they hadn't really taken off very broadly because it involved, you know, using them involved uh, pretty uh, significant protein engineering, and you had to make a new protein for each experiment in a cell. And so we looked at this and said, well, you know, if we have a single protein whose, whose, uh, whose DNA cleaving activity and specificity can be controlled by simply changing a short uh, guide RNA sequence, that could be a very nice way to, a very simple way to do this where you don't have to change the nature of the protein in every experiment, but simply change uh, the guiding RNA. And so that's really what we proposed in this original uh, work that we published with Emanuel's lab. I'd like to show you a little movie that um, just illustrates how we kind of imagine that this might work inside the nucleus of an animal or a plant cell, where the DNA is, of course, uh, highly packaged. And this just shows zooming into the cell. And you know that, that in, uh, in eukaryotic cells, the DNA is in the form of chromatin. So the DNA is wound around uh, nucleosome uh, core proteins, histone proteins, to form these, these uh, structures that you can see here in green. And so somehow, this bacterial enzyme has to search through the DNA that's packaged like this in these cells to find, a, in principle, a single site that has a sequence that matches the sequence of the guide RNA that it's programmed with. And when it finds that site, it unwinds the DNA. It binds, as I showed you before, with it forming this RNA-DNA hybrid. And then the DNA is cut and, um, and somehow released to repair enzymes in the cell that can then repair this, and in this example, by actually uh, recombining in a piece of DNA that in, results in the integration of new genetic information at the site of the break. And so this turns out to be a way that one can actually uh, change the DNA sequence in a very precise fashion. And for reasons that we're still working to understand, this bacterial enzyme seems to be quite capable of dealing with the kind of higher order structure that it finds in a, in a eukaryotic cell. And this seems to work uh, very broadly across different cell types and tissues and, and, and whole organisms. So let me now tell you, turn a little bit to how we think this actually works. And so my lab has continued to investigate you know, this sort of molecular process with the hopes of understanding and sort of satisfying our basic curiosity about this, but also um, improving it as a technology and, and turning it into, into something that we hope eventually will do things like allow uh, the cure of, of genetic disease. And so uh, people ask, you know, sort of why, why did this sort of uh, take off uh, very quickly the way it did? And I really like to point out three things. One is the power of base pairing. You know, I think, uh, you know, biology over and over has showed us that, you know, if you look at the RNA interference pathway in eukaryotic cells, for example, that takes advantage of RNA, in that case, RNA-RNA uh, base pairing for specificity. Here we have RNA-DNA hybridization that is being utilized for specificity, and it's just a, it's a powerful and relatively uh, simple way to, to uh, program a protein. And um, there's many applications of this, of course. And as I'm going to show you, uh, this is a system that has really evolved to be highly, uh, very fast and, and really quite accurate in terms of its targeting uh, capabilities. Because, of course, in bacteria, uh, it's, it's sort of a life or death selection. So it really has to be good at, at finding and, um, and allowing cells to, to get rid of viral DNA sequences. So, um, so this is a protein that, a couple other things I want to just point out. So first of all, the Cas9 protein is quite easily modified. So many labs now have been able to make uh, different versions of this protein. So I think it was Stanley Chi at Stanford working with Jonathan Weissman and Wendell Lim that first made the, uh, what they call DCAS9, sort of the deactivated form of this protein that doesn't cut DNA but allows uh, transcriptional control 
in, in a still in a sort of an RNA programmed way. So that's a, uh, an application of this that allows uh, uh, not permanent changes. Uh, it, rather than making permanent changes to the genome, you can actually control the way information is expressed at particular uh, genes. And then, of course, many different versions of what I call chimeric Cas9. So this means linking Cas9 up to other enzymatic activities that allow modification of DNA in particular ways. And there's lots of ongoing uh, work uh, doing this kind of thing. Also, I want to point out that it's naturally multiplexed. So in bacteria, this protein is programmed with multiple different guide RNAs to allow protection against different viruses, much the way our own uh, immune systems work. And so, of course, scientists can take advantage of that by programming this protein with multiple different guide RNAs in, to affect changes in the genome at multiple sites in the same experiment, something that was really not uh, possible with previous uh, technologies. And as I'm going to show you uh, now, it's really a protein that has remarkable ability to search the genome very quickly and uh, find targets uh, really quite uh, accurately. So one of the first experiments that we did to, to start investigating how this uh, protein actually works was uh, involved a, a great collaboration between our lab and the lab of Eric Green at Columbia. So Eric had come to Berkeley and he talked about his work using uh, what he calls DNA curtains. These are single molecules of DNA and he was using uh, whole phage uh, genomes in these experiments to look at how enzymes search through a large DNA molecule to uh, do things like repair a mutation. And Sam Sternberg, a student in my lab at the time, saw this talk and said this would be such a great system to use to study these CRISPR uh, proteins. And so we got together with Eric and uh, in, a, in a series of experiments done by, by Sam in my lab and Cy Redding in, in Eric Green's lab, they did uh, experiments using the curtain system to investigate the way Cas9 searches through a large DNA uh, molecule. And I'm just going to summarize what the findings of this and show you a little bit of what these experiments look like. So this is actually showing you a, uh, a movie that um, illustrates the way these DNA curtains are set up. So each of these green strands is a 48 KB DNA molecule corresponding to phage lambda uh, DNA. And these are molecules that are tethered on one end to a slide. And then when we have buffer flowing uh, across the slide, these molecules are extended and we can uh, visualize them uh, and also visualize the way that proteins that are labeled, in this case with a quantum dot, can interact with the DNA. And so we have Cas9 uh, that's labeled with a quantum dot and programmed with a particular guide RNA in this experiment. And you can see that a lot of those proteins are lining up on the DNA at a place that corresponds um, uh, to the site that is recognized by this particular guide. And so by using that kind of a strategy, we could investigate what happens when you program this protein with a, a mismatched uh, guide, for example, and how long does it take to find a target and things like that. And what came out of these experiments is really three things. One is that uh, we found that DNA binding uh, really begins at these PAM motifs. So rather than this protein searching initially for a 20 base pair match to the guide RNA, it really looks first for these uh, sequences, and only then does it interrogate the adjacent uh, DNA for a match. We also figured out that binding to the PAM triggers a uh, change in the protein structure that leads to DNA unwinding. And we didn't initially know about the protein structural change, but we could certainly tell that the DNA was opening up after this uh, PAM contact occurred. And then only then was it in a competent uh, state to cut the DNA. And finally, uh, we found that, and sorry, cut off the bottom here, but basically we found that uh, this protein stays very tightly associated to DNA even after the DNA is cut. So very high affinity binding to the product. And so Sam uh, Sternberg really wanted to investigate sort of this question. It was sort of hinted uh, at by these uh, single molecule experiments because what we found was that Cas9 was spending more time on portions of this DNA that were more G-rich. And so it really suggested that it might be spending time there at those regions because of these PAM uh, motifs and, and interactions with this site. And so to test that more directly, Sam did a biochemical experiment in which we took a DNA, and this is sort of just illustrating how we often do these experiments in the lab, is we take a DNA molecule, it, it can either be two DNA oligonucleotides annealed together, or it can be a, a larger a piece of DNA that has a, a sequence uh, with, a, with a PAM site in it that matches the sequence of a guide 
uh, RNA molecule, which is shown down here. And when this base pairing occurs between the RNA and the DNA, the DNA opens up, and then the protein can actually cut uh, this, this uh, DNA sequence. And so what Sam did was to set up an experiment like this, a biochemical experiment, in which we wanted to investigate the ability of different types of DNA molecules to compete for binding to the Cas9 protein. And so the idea was to take a DNA substrate that we could radio label as a target site in it, and here's the PAM. And so this is a very uh, efficiently cleaved by the Cas9 protein when it has a guide RNA that matches this sequence. And the question was, could we add different kinds of unlabeled competitor DNAs uh, shown over here that had absolutely no uh, complementarity to this target site, but instead had just different numbers of PAMs. And the question was, could any of these compete for binding to Cas9 and thereby reduce its ability to bind and, and, and cut this, this actual substrate? And the result of that experiment is plotted here. And what we're basically plotting is the cleavage rate as a function of concentration of the uh, competitor uh, DNA molecule over here. And what, you, what you're looking at is basically the fact that the more PAMs we had in the DNA sequence, the greater the ability of that competitor DNA to prevent binding to the substrate by just by competition, which really suggested that, um, that this is a protein that really is interacting largely with these uh, PAM motifs rather than with uh, an initial recognition of this target site. And really to test that, um, uh, idea more directly, Sam made a competitor that looked like this, where we had an exact uh, match to the target site in the substrate DNA and a single mutation in the PAM site of this competitor DNA molecule. And this molecule is as lousy a competitor as this one here. So in other words, it's really about the PAM rather than this target site that in, uh, allows this uh, uh, DNA molecule to interact with uh, the Cas9 protein. So of course we wondered, you know, how does this work and what, what happens when, when this uh, PAM interaction occurs. And one of the things that emerged out of a collaboration with my colleague Eva Nogales at Berkeley and involved uh, two students uh, that you can't see the names of here, uh, Sam Sternberg and David Taylor, was using negative stain electron microscopy to visualize the Cas9 protein as it went from a, uh, the structure of the protein alone to the surveillance complex where it's bound to the guide RNA and then finally to a complex that's assembled with a target DNA molecule. And even though these uh, reconstructions were at very modest resolution, about 30 angstrom resolution, we could actually see very clearly in these EM images that the protein underwent what looked like a quite a significant change in conformation upon binding to the guide RNA that opened up a channel in the protein where uh, the uh, RNA-DNA hybrid would form once this uh, complex assembled with a substrate. And I just want to show you a movie because what's been really uh, sort of fun then that over the last uh, couple of years is as crystal structures of Cas9 in different states of assembly have become available from us and, and the lab of, of, of uh, Osamu Nureki and also from Martin Jinek, it's been possible to create a movie that morphs between these different structural states. And you'll see something really quite uh, remarkable in this movie. And I should say it was made by a, a rotation student in my lab, graduate student, uh, Ben LaFrance. And so this movie starts off with Cas9 in, uh, 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 just in the sort of the state where it's the protein alone, no guide RNA bound. And uh, so you'll start off by seeing this, here's the protein structure. And as it morphs to the structure bound to the guide, you saw a huge change, a rotation and confirmation of this part of the protein right here that opens up a channel where the guide strand of the RNA in orange ends up uh, located, sort of in the center of the protein. And then as it morphs to the structure bound to a strand of DNA, you can see there's an additional change in conformation of the protein here to accommodate that R the formation of this RNA-DNA hybrid. And then this final uh, conformational change was initially purely our imagination because this is actually one of the catalytic domains of the protein, one of the cleavers of DNA. And in all of the available uh, crystal structures up until that point, this uh, domain was in the wrong place to actually cut the DNA. So we knew there had to be an additional uh, conformational change of this protein to allow it to actually cleave DNA. And in work that I'm not going to show you in any detail today, but we published uh, very recently, 
uh, with Sam Sternberg as the first author, Sam and other students in the lab were able to show that this actually uh, we can actually detect this conformational change and the others as well by putting pairs of dyes on the surface of the protein that allow detection of conformational changes by looking at fluorescence resonance energy tra transfer between those dyes. So we can really map out these conformational changes through that sort of a biochemical assay. And so this is really just a, a cartoon that illustrates, um, summarizes our model for how uh, Cas we think Cas9 interacts with uh, DNA, uh, potentially even GN DNA that's involved in chromatin, based on, up until this point, uh, in vitro experiments, doing experiments with the single molecules as well as uh, in bulk uh, biochemical assays. And, and our, our data really pointed to a model in which the protein RNA complex, rather than binding on one end of DNA and sliding to find a target, instead had very rapid uh, binding kinetics, or binding and releasing DNA very quickly, slowing down when it encountered a PAM sequence, which allowed time for interrogation of the adjacent uh, DNA sequence. And, and only then, if there was complementarity between this uh, sequence of DNA and the guide RNA, would this uh, uh, interaction be stabilized sufficiently that the DNA could begin to unwind, the RNA-DNA hybrid could form, and then eventually that final conformational change could happen that would allow DNA to be cut. Um, but this was all based on, you know, in vitro uh, data, and we kept thinking, wouldn't it be great if we could actually see how this works in a, in a real cell? And so this was the challenge that was taken up by Spencer Knight, a chemistry student in the lab who uh, joined my lab and the lab of Bob Tejan to use super-resolution microscopy to try to investigate the search mechanism of Cas9 as it moves around the nucleus of live cells. And his idea was to explore the way that Cas9 might be able to interact with DNA that was not just uh, you know, naked on a, on a slide, but really was wrapped up in the kind of uh, higher order structure that we know occurs in chromatin. And, um, and so the question was really, you know, could we understand not only how it deals with chromatin structure, but also how it finds sites in uh, genomes that are much larger than a bacterial genome, and how it deals with higher order uh, nuclear organization, so the way that DNA might be located in sort of neighborhoods inside the nucleus. And I just want to summarize a couple of, of, of things that Spencer did. So he figured out a way to label Cas9 in living cells. And this is done by making a fusion protein. So we, we're actually using the, uh, the deactivated form of the enzyme so it doesn't actually cut DNA, so, which allows us to visualize it more easily. And we hook it up to a, uh, what's called a halo tag. This is a little uh, protein domain that has been modified so that it will react uh, uh, sort of um, uh, permanently with a, a small molecule that can be a fluorophore like this in living cells. And so this can actually be introduced into, into live cells that are expressing this fusion protein. And there's then uh, this very specific chemistry occurs that puts the fluorescent tag on this fusion protein. And so I'm going to show you a couple of little uh, movies that show you fluorescent dots moving around in cells. And that's actually how we're doing it, is using this kind of a, a tagged version of Cas9. And so um, one of the first things that, we wanted, that Spencer wanted to do was really just to understand uh, how the behavior of Cas9, uh, what, it, what it looks like when it's inside a, a living cell, and then how it changes when we program it with different kinds of guide RNAs. And so I want to first show you a movie that um, illustrates, uh, this sort of looks, is what the, some of the raw data looks like. We're taking 10 millisecond uh, snapshots of, of uh, the nucleus of a living cell that contains this fluorescently labeled Cas9. And you can see these little dots uh, kind of moving around. So these are individual uh, particles of Cas9. And one thing that we noticed right away was that these particles are moving incredibly fast. So they're very, very, very fast kinetics. And what I'm plotting over here is, uh, is a plot of the log of the diffusion coefficient of these uh, particles as a function of frequency of particles with this behavior. And you can see that we have, for both the uh, protein alone, the APO form of Cas9, and the protein programmed with what Spencer calls a nonsense guide, so it doesn't recognize any particular site in the genome, these both have very similar behaviors, uh, very rapid diffusion around the cell, and much fat, moving much faster than what we see for uh, a, a histone protein, for example, H2B, which is one of the proteins that is responsible for the higher order chromatin uh, structure. So that was one uh, sort of interesting observation. And then uh, when we program Cas9 with a, 
guide RNA that recognizes about 300,000 sites in the genome, so it uh, should be allowing Cas9 to park itself at many different places in the genome, we actually see a very dramatic change where now many of these particles uh, have much slower uh, kinetic behavior in the cells, and you can sort of see that here. A lot of these particles are kind of hanging around for quite a long time at a particular position, and we think that's because they've found a target site in the genome and they just hold on. And, um, and you can almost see biphasic behavior. We still have some particles moving very quickly, but we have a large population that have slowed way down. And um, so this has allowed us to start asking questions like, how long does Cas9 stick around on a site that has a perfect match to the guide RNA versus sites that have one or a few uh, mismatches with the guide? And what we find is that really uh, the lifetime of these particles on a, on a bona fide target site is minutes in these experiments versus less than a second for, for sequences that have mismatches with the guide. So big uh, differential there. Finally, I wanted to show you another experiment that he did. So we want, wondered about uh, access to different types of chromatin. So you probably know that in cells, you know, we have uh, euchromatic regions that are uh, sort of more open and active versus uh, heterochromatic regions that are highly compacted. And so what, we, what Spencer did in this experiment was he had a fluorescently labeled uh, protein called HP1, which is involved in heterochromatin, that is, allow us, allows us to figure out where heterochromatic uh, regions are in the nucleus, and then we can um, on that sort of background, we can track these fluorescently labeled Cas9 particles as they move around this labeled DNA. It doesn't look like much when I show it to you like this, but when we stack up these images, what we see is that, so here are the, these uh, very bright regions that are marking heterochromatic parts of the nuclear DNA. And you can see that when you look at these tracks of Cas9, we see that, uh, that although most of the tracks are in the euchromatic parts of the nucleus, we do see occasional forays into heterochromatic regions. And that's actually consistent with the fact that we see evidence for uh, gene editing in those types of those, those regions. It's sort of remarkable that somehow this protein is able to deal with DNA even in these compacted regions. And I think that might actually be just saying something very interesting about chromatin dynamics that we're still uh, trying to figure out with respect uh, to Cas9. And I want to show you one uh, little uh, sort of recent uh, observation that we have. So you may know that in nature, there are multiple different types of Cas9 proteins. And you know people have been interested in this because they vary in size. So uh, we've been discussing uh, up until now in this talk the, this, the protein uh, called from strep pyogenes, which is a type 2A uh, protein, which has a molecular weight of about 160 kilodaltons, and there are some much smaller proteins belonging to the type 2C Cas9s that are about 25% smaller or so. And those have been interesting from the perspective of delivery because they might be easier to package into viral vectors and things like that. So, um, you know, one idea was, well, you know, if they all work the same, why don't we just pick a smaller version that nature has evolved? And so we've been studying some of these different Cas9s in the laboratory and using biochemical methods to investigate their activities. And one of the things that emerged early on, uh, not just from us, but from other labs, Feng Zhang and, and uh, 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 George Church and among others, is that these type 2C proteins are actually not, typically not very robust at genome engineering. And so why is that? And I just want to show you one observation that I think is intriguing. And that is a comparison that we did of, a, of this uh, strep pyogenes Cas9 that we've been uh, talking about, cutting uh, DNA, versus one of the type 2C proteins uh, that we call, we abbreviate CDI. And uh, so the CDI protein is not, uh, has not been observed to catalyze uh, genome editing in, in cells. And the question was, well, why not? Because it seems to be active in, in, in vitro. But when we did a careful biochemical analysis, this is plotting a fraction of DNA cleaved over time, what we saw that we're, was that whereas the pyogenes protein is very fast at cutting double-stranded DNA, so this is doing an experiment where we have a double-stranded DNA substrate like this, the CDI a smaller a Cas9 protein is very slow, right? So it could cut DNA, but it's quite, the kinetics are very different. And so we started thinking about this and wondering if part of the issue here, so when we compare a structural, uh, sort of predicted structural model of this smaller Cas9 to the structures of this bigger protein, we noticed that part of the parts that are missing in the smaller protein correspond to parts that we think are actually involved in the helicase activity, the unwindase uh, activity of this protein. And to test that possibility, what uh, Mitch O'Connell and Enbo Ma in the lab did was to generate a 
version of this DNA substrate that has exactly the same sequence on the bottom strand, so it can still make the full 20 base pair match, uh, matched uh, RNA-DNA hybrid with Cas9 with its guide RNA, but had mismatches uh, over here in the DNA, right next to the door to this PAM motif. So the idea was to use a uh, sequence of DNA like this where we've just sort of destabilized these first two base pairs, thinking that we might give the protein a hand with opening up the DNA. When we do that, now what we find is that when we test this uh, CDI protein, we find that it's now got very, very fast kinetics cutting this DNA substrate. And so we think that this really suggests that this is a protein that has a reduced ability to open up DNA, which may explain why it's not so great at genome engineering. And one, I, one thing that we're currently thinking about is how we can take the scaffold of these smaller enzymes and turn them back into robust helicases by introducing some of the features that are found in these larger proteins, and thereby maybe making a smaller version of Cas9 that will be a robust uh, technology for DNA, for ge uh, genome engineering. So um, I just want to say a little bit about this. So you know, one of the things we're thinking about a lot in the lab in terms of applications is what the challenges are going forward. So now that there are robust uh, tools like this to, to cut DNA and induce changes in cells, um, that's great for research purposes, but what if we want to use that as a therapeutic? And I think really, uh, from my perspective, the, the challenges going forward are really about delivery. How do we get it into cells, in, especially in a tissue-specific uh, fashion? How do we control the way that DNA is repaired after it's cut is clearly a challenge. We want to be able to control that in the future if we really want to have precise, uh, accurate editing that occurs the same way in every cell. And, and then, of course, thinking about the societal and ethical uh, issues that come up when we edit certain types of cells, like thinking about editing human uh, germ cells, germline cells, like sperm or eggs or, or embryos. And so I just want to briefly mention work that we've been doing with colleagues at UC San Francisco in which we uh, took a sort of, to sort of a think about how do we address this question. And of course, we're biochemists, so we approach this from the perspective of thinking about the way that we work with this protein in the laboratory. And so many uh, labs have used uh, these uh, strategies here to introduce the Cas9 protein and its guide RNA into cells, namely encoding it on a, on a, a DNA molecule or encoding it in, uh, in the form of RNA, a messenger RNA that would encode the Cas9 protein together with the guide RNA. And those can work, obviously, very well uh, when we introduce those into cells. It's harder to think about how we get these molecules into, uh, into, into an organism in a tissue-specific fashion, for example. And we started thinking, what if we could just do that by pre-assembling a protein RNA complex, much as we do in our biochemical lab, but um, decorate this protein with ligands, chemical ligands, that would make it look like a cargo for a receptor that's exposed on the surface of particular types of cells. And so we, um, we've uh, been, in, to sort of bring us, uh, get, get us closer to, to thinking about how to do that, we started working with Jennifer Puck and Alex Marson, two immunologists at UCSF, to think about how we could introduce these kinds of molecules into immune cells, which have uh, you know, been very difficult to work with, especially for genome editing, because they're not easy to transform or transfect. And so um, the things that we've found, this is sort of summarizing uh, some of our results with Alex Marson's lab, is that we can detect editing of, uh, of uh, T cells within a few hours or, or other kinds of cells as well. So we can uh, introduce these protein uh, complexes. Right now we're doing it just by uh, nucleofection, so we introduce them with a little electric shock to the cells, but we want to in the future do it uh, chemically or even through a receptor-mediated pathway. We find that the half-life of this RNA protein complex, or RNP, is about 24 hours, so it minimizes off-targeting, and we really don't detect off-target effects uh, in, in these cells. And finally, we can actually co-deliver DNA templates for repair, so we can really enhance the level at which we get recombination that introduces new information at the site of the repair, uh, which is a real advantage if you want to think about fixing a, a gene, for example. And so we've been doing this um, using, initially using uh, primary human T cells and um, been able to do this uh, for uh, making changes in these cells to study the, the function of, of these particular genes. But in the long term, we really want to move towards, uh, towards therapeutic editing and thinking about how we can do this in, of course, things like hematopoietic stem cells. <clears throat> 
And, and so I want to just, um, in the last couple of minutes, just um, cycle back to this question of ethics. And I, for me, this really you know, was something that came about uh, somewhat slowly. You know, initially, I was just very excited about all the science that was going on in, in our lab and, and others with this technology. But really, you know, the question kind of increasingly was coming up, you know, really, how should we think about a technology like this? And what should we do now that genomes can be edited uh, relatively easily? And for me, it really came home when, uh, in early 2014, when a group published a paper in which they were able to edit the germlines of monkeys and show that they could get genetically modified monkeys that not only had changes to their cells in their body, but they could transmit those changes to their progeny. So, it, it, you know, and I started thinking, well, if you could do this in monkeys and mice and rats, and, you know, we'd probably do it in humans, and, you know, when will someone try to do that? And so that kind of motivated me to get a, a, a small group of scientists together. We met in the Napa Valley in January of this year. Uh, David Baltimore was there and Paul Berg, both of whom had been involved in discussions about the ethics of molecular cloning back in the 70s. And that meeting resulted in publication of this piece, which was a, a sort of a, um, uh, you know, a perspective in Science Magazine in which we proposed what we called a prudent path forward. And we recommended that scientists not proceed with any clinical application of human germline editing and human embryos uh, to give time for the community to get together and discuss this uh, more, more broadly and certainly uh, globally. And so as Doug mentioned, this led, uh, we were very pleased that the National Academies took up this issue. And last week in Washington, we had a meeting that was sponsored by the National Academies of Science in the US, the, in China, and the UK. Um, to discuss this, and um, this, I think, has really kicked off a, a more global conversation about how to use this technology in ways that will be beneficial to human society and also respect uh, different, uh, different societal norms and, and, and ethical values. So stay tuned, because that will certainly be an ongoing uh, discussion, and I just want to um, also mention that I've been involved in uh, catalyzing the formation of this group, the Innovative Genomics Initiative, which is a UC Berkeley, UCSF collaboration. It's an academic endeavor that seeks to use genome editing for different kinds of applications, uh, especially in human health, but we hope in the future in other systems, and uh, sponsoring research that is funded by uh, both uh, uh, philanthropy uh, donors as well as by uh, companies. So check us out on the web. And I want to close by, hmm, I don't know why the projector went out, but. Um, but this is my most important slide, but <laughs> because it's my thank you. But um, okay, so I'll have to uh, see. Press here to show video on screen. Is that going to work? Ah, wonderful. Okay, so this is very important because this is the the wonderful group of people involved in the science uh, that I talked about, and I mentioned uh, many of them along the way uh, today. This was a picture taken at our lab, 20-year uh, sort of uh, lab uh, anniversary trip to my hometown in Hawaii last year. Um, and uh, so <laughs> we don't do that every year. I have to save my money for another 20 years to do it again. But. And, uh, and I, I certainly want to thank collaborators. I mentioned them along the way, but I want to again highlight you know, wonderful uh, work that we had the chance to do with Emmanuel and, and her group, especially Chris Chylinski in her lab. Um, also, uh, Eva Nogales, my colleague at Berkeley, for all of the EM uh, structural work that we're doing, Eric Green for the single molecule studies, and, um, and also Alex Marson and Jennifer Puck at uh, UCSF for the, the more applied work. And, um, and then, of course, we couldn't do anything without uh, money. And again, I want to really highlight, you know, we had some early support from the Gates Foundation. Um, we had support, of course, from, I'm very grateful to the Howard Hughes Medical Institute, but I also really want to give a special shout out. You can't quite see the emblem here, but it's for the National Science Foundation. So NSF gave me a very small uh, grant early on, back before anybody really even had heard of CRISPRs, to hire the first student that came in and started doing curiosity-driven research that led in, obviously, a totally unexpected direction. So that's my plug for you know, basic uh, science funding. I think it's really critical to pursue your passions in science and you never know where it'll take you. Thank you very much. Thank you.